all collapsing. Okay. All right. Want to take a trip? Yes. Okay, we are going to do that. We're going back more than 100 years. Going back to the St. Louis World's Fair of 1904. It was an absolutely spectacular event. And if you don't know about it, you maybe know about the movie. Meet Me in St. Louis, Judy Garland. That was one of her first movies in which she danced, she sang. And of course, there's a classic uh, song in there. Uh, Meet Me in St. Louis, Louis, which is interesting for several well, for several reasons. One is, of course, now we pronounce the name of the city as St. Louis, but in the song it was uh, Louis Louis Meet Me at the Fair. Don't tell me lights are shining any place but there. And that was spectacular because this was 1904. Electricity was relatively new. And I'll show you what it look, looked like in a, in a moment. Um, if you go further down, they got ice cream cones and Ferris wheel. Well, both of those are interesting stories that we'll take a quick look at. But first, this business of uh, the electricity. This was the Palace of Electricity. And one of the interesting things about this World's Fair is that all of the buildings were temporary but they look absolutely sophisticated, but they all disappeared within a year of the closing of the fair, which is, is really quite amazing if you look, see, you know, how spectacular. So this was the, the Palace of Electricity and all... Now today, of course, now this is... like that in 1904, with that many uh, electric bulbs uh, lighting up the whole building. And Edison was actually there in person to supervise the, the, the building of this. And then there was the Ferris wheel. Again, take a, take a look at the, the building, right? Look, look at all the, all the detail of, of construction. And all of this was done for, the, the fair didn't even last one year. It was less than that. Now, uh, most of it was just plaster. So, you know, they obviously were not made uh, to be permanent. Now, the, the Ferris wheel actually uh, was not new for the 1904 World's Fair. It was built for the 1893 Columbian e Exposition in Chicago. And uh, that, of course, was to uh, celebrate uh, Columbus's discovery of, of America. And uh, the Ferris wheel, which was at that time the first in the world, was built for that occasion. Now, the, the cars on that Ferris wheel, uh, it was all taken apart in, in Chicago and then rebuilt uh, in St. Louis in, in, in 1904. Those cars were huge because this whole wheel had about 2,000 people on it at a given time. <laughs> that, that's a lot of people. It was a magnificent construction, and here you can kind of see the size of those, those cars. They were like a van, like a large, uh, large van. So it was really very, very uh, uh, impressive. Unfortunately, it no longer exists. It was uh, taken down after the fair, essentially sold as scrap. But obviously there are many other Ferris wheels uh, in the world uh, today. Well, we're gonna take a stop here at the Palace of Agriculture. Once again, you know, an, an absolutely magnificent uh, building. I mean, it kind of looks like, you know, this would be with us today. But no, there's not even there, and there's no remnant uh, of it. And just look at the colossates there, and you know how uh, how uh, neatly they were built, and the giant clock, uh, all bedecked with uh, with flowers. So this was really quite something. Now inside the Palace of Agriculture, there were fascinating displays. This was the Missouri display. Everything here 
is built out of corn. These are all corn cobs. Everything, the whole construction is made out of corn. Because of course, Missouri was a large producer of, of corn. Um, that elephant, this was part of the California display. That elephant is totally covered with almonds. There's, there's of course a wire skeleton inside, but totally covered with almonds. And uh, all the other nuts that California produces were there. Every state, I think except for four, had a display, uh, as well as over 50 countries, all of whom took part in, in, in the fair. Uh, almonds, of course, are a very big part of um, California's economy. And these days, uh, there's controversy over that. You know, you know why? The water. The water. They, it, uh, almonds require a tremendous amount of water to, to grow. And California has a habitual shortage of, of water, but still almonds are a very significant uh, uh, crop. And one of the visitors to the fair was President Teddy Roosevelt. And that's him over here. He walked around and he was undoubtedly impressed by a statue of himself in the North Dakota uh, exhibit. That statue, what is impressive about it? It's made of butter. The whole statue is totally fabricated of butter. And believe it or not, there's a, even today, there's a whole world out there of butter sculptors. Uh, obviously, there, there's you know, uh, issues about that as well. I mean, using a, a food uh, in a world where you know a third of people go hungry to bed every night of, of using butter for uh, for sculpture. And Canada had an exhibit. There it is. Know what it is? It is a replica of part of the Parliament building. If you're familiar with the Parliament building in Ottawa, there's the library right at the back of the of the Parliament, and that library was recreated here, all made out of grains that are grown in Canada. Uh, so again, I mean, obviously there's some sort of underlying structure uh, there, some sort of wire framework, but. Uh, it was just a display of uh, Canadian uh, grains. In this palace of agriculture, there were all kinds of, of interesting displays. Uh, for example, this was the first time ever that puffed rice uh, had been uh, shown to the public. It was basically introduced at the St. Louis uh, World's Fair and it became very popular. But anyway, as you can see, there are all kinds of um, of displays there, but one of the displays that uh, attracted a tremendous amount of attention was the so-called pure food display. Uh, at that time, there were already some concerns about the safety of the food supply. And there was a demonstration bench where a demonstrator would um, carry out various experiments in front of the public. And one of the most interesting uh, experiments was um, a display of ketchup. And the demonstrator showed that this ketchup was actually colored with what we know as a coal tar dye. Now, coal tar dyes were uh, first introduced in 1856 by William Henry Perkin, young English chemist, who was actually looking for um, a synthesis for quinine, because at that time, quinine was much needed for uh, treatment of malaria. And uh, it was only available from the cinchona tree that grew in Peru. So there was a need to find a synthetic version, and Perkin looked for one, never found it. But during his uh, experiments, he accidentally discovered uh, that a chemical in coal tar called aniline could be converted into a dye, into a colored molecule, and many other colors ensued from there. And indeed, back in these days, in the early 1900s, 
foods such as this version of ketchup were colored with the coal tar dye. And that, of course, intrigued people, not in a positive way, because they didn't want, you know, their ketchup to be colored with a, a coal tar dye. They wanted that ketchup to be pure and be made only of tomatoes. Well, next to this the display area was an exhibit by the Heinz Company, uh, who were not thrilled by that uh, demonstration. Although Heinz was not one of the, the culprits in this ketchup uh, issue, uh, their ketchup really was made out of tomato. But of course, people lumped everything in the same category. And they saw this demonstration where the exhibitor, you know, took a solvent and extracted a, a, a dye from the uh, from the ketchup and used it to, to color a piece of flannel. And I mean, that, you know, upset people. Anyway, Heinz was uh, 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 also, of course, an exhibitor there. And there's an interesting memento uh, of, uh, of it here. This is a keychain that they handed out at the 1904 uh, World's Fair. Anyway, at this exhibit, uh, this pure food exhibit, the demonstrator, after showing that ketchup was colored with a synthetic dye, uh, asked the onlookers to focus on, on some strawberry jam. And he said, do you think this is really made of strawberry? Now, this was a jam that was sold at, at that time in, in stores. And he showed that this was nothing more than mashed pumpkin uh, and crushed Timothy seeds. So it was a totally uh, adulterated version of, of strawberry jam. He uh, also went on to uh, demonstrate, for example, a sample of pepper, ground pepper that was sold in stores at that time and showed that it was nothing but ground up shells from nuts uh, that were colored black. So people, of course, were, of course, concerned about all of this, this extensive food adulter adulteration. So when they walked out of the Palace of Agriculture onto what was called the Pike, which was the main thoroughfare of, of the fair, uh, they were very skeptical with all the food concessions that lined the way because they had just, you know, witnessed a demonstration of food adulteration. So they were obviously skeptical, especially when they came to a sausage stand. Now, sausages had been around, of course, for a very long time. The sausage manufacturer goes back to the Middle Ages. You don't really want to know how they're manufactured, but they go back to, uh, to those days. And it was very common at public gatherings such as fairs to sell sausages. But how? Uh, well, in those days, the common method of selling a sausage was to hand out white gloves to the customer so that his hands would not get greasy from holding the sausage. So they would just pick up the sausage, eat it, and then give back the gloves. Uh, obviously, when people came out of the demonstration at the, uh, the Palace of Agriculture, they were very skeptical about, you know, what was in those uh, sausages. But nevertheless, you know, they, they bought them. But one day, it turns out, so the story goes, the sausage mender ran out of white gloves. Well, luckily, next to him was a waffle maker in the next booth. So he had the idea to take the waffle, wrap it around the hot dog, so he didn't have to hand out the white gloves. And as the story goes, the hot dog was born. Well, it's uh, sort of a, a nice romanticized story. It isn't really true, uh, because there were versions of sausages wrapped in various kinds of buns that sold well before this. At the Polo Grounds in New York, the baseball uh, stadium, uh, they actually sold sausages in French buns. Uh, but the story is around that, you know, the hot dog dates back to the St. Louis World's Fair. It doesn't, but it certainly was popularized there. Now, a much better case can be made for the ice cream cone. That really, uh, dates back to the 1904 World's Fair. Now, of course, ice cream was known before that, 
But ice cream usually in those days was sold in little cardboard cups. And as the story goes, one of the ice cream vendors at the fair ran out of those cardboard cups. Luckily, next to him was a waffle maker. <laughs> so he had an idea. He took the waffle, he rolled it, and plunked a scoop of ice cream on top of it, and the ice cream cone was born. <laughs> now, this actually uh, is possible that it, this really did happen, because we do have some authentic pictures from the St. Louis World's Fair. And here is a, a classic one. And certainly, if you take a look here, it looks like those cones are made of a waffle. And this picture actually became so famous that it was commemorated on a US stamp. And there it is. And uh, of course, here the idea is that, that uh, the fair gave birth to the ice cream. And notice the Ferris wheel, which was on the symbols of the fair uh, behind. So uh, whether or not uh, you know, this is literally true, uh, we'll never be able to determine whether or not someone had the idea of putting a scoop of ice cream on top of something else before. But there, this likely is, is correct. Uh, one other item that uh, is said to have been born at the St. Louis World's Fair is cotton candy. Now, they didn't call it cotton candy in those days. They called it fairy floss. And uh, it was an interesting invention. Now, it actually uh, was invented about a year before the World's Fair. And uh, the inventor was William Morrison, who worked hand in hand with a candy maker called John Wharton. And the two had developed a machine. And here it is. This was advertised. Uh, hundred dollars, as you see, in those days. I mean, but that was a significant in investment. And the way that this worked is still the way that cotton candy is, is made today. I mean, you've seen it, you know, at various kinds of um, amusement park. You have a large basin, which is heated, and uh, sugar is put into it. The basin is heated, the sugar melts, and the thing starts to spin around. And there are tiny holes in this basin. So as it starts to spin around, the melted sugar is extruded through those tiny holes. And when it hits the cooler air outside, it instantly freezes. That's how you get the, the cotton candy. Now, the interesting thing here is that William Morrison, the inventor of this machine, was a dentist. So he he benefited from this uh, invention of cotton candy, not only financially in terms of selling the machines, but also the patients, of course, who would have their teeth decayed because they ate all of that cotton candy. And of course, cotton candy is still with us today. Uh, you can even get it in many different colors, uh, which actually are coal tar dyes, but nobody worries about that now. Also introduced at the World's Fair and popularized, although once again not invented there, uh, was peanut butter. Uh, peanut butter was sold at the World's Fair uh, in a booth by a doctor, Dr. Ambrose Straub, who had invented a machine. And there is the diagram of the machine, which would squeeze the peanuts into a paste. Straub was a medical doctor. And in those days, there were a lot of people who had trouble chewing things. Why? Because they didn't have teeth, right? In those days, dentistry was very primitive, very common for people to lose their teeth by about middle age, right? Especially if they ate cotton candy. Uh, so um, peanut butter was originally invented as a soft material that could be easily eaten by people who had trouble chewing things. 
So the story is that it was introduced at the uh, World Fair. What is true is that it was popularized there, just like with the other, other foods. But it had a history before that. In fact, a Canadian chemist, a Quebec chemist, by the name of Marcellus Gilmore Edson, had invented a very similar machine a couple of years before for the same reason, to help people who had trouble chewing, but he never patented it. So he, he doesn't get credit. Also, before um, the 1904 World's Fair, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, of course, of cereal fame, also invented a way to smash peanuts to make a paste. But in his case, it was for a different reason. It wasn't for people who had trouble chewing. He thought that eating meat was sexually inflammatory, and he was against that. Uh, he was, um, uh, Kellogg was a very, very strange uh, character. He was actually a trained medical uh, doctor, uh, but um, he had some very bizarre beliefs, uh, including that, that uh, uh, the sex act was dangerous, so he never consummated his own marriage, uh, although he had 43 adopted children. So he was, you know, pretty good uh, person. But uh, he introduced the, uh, his, his version of the peanut paste as an alternative to meat, because he knew that meat was a source of protein, people needed a source of protein, and he had peanut butter in order to curb the sexual inflammation that would be caused by uh, uh, eating meat. Also uh, introduced, or at least popularized at the World's Fair, was Dr. Pepper. Uh, Dr. Pepper was a soft drink uh, actually invented several years before in Vaco, Texas. And uh, in this very corner drugstore, where the, uh, the inventor, who was not Dr. Pepper, nobody really knows why this uh, is called Dr. Pepper. There never was any Dr. Pepper. Um, but it was invented as a, a drink, essentially uh, to compete with uh, Coca-Cola. And it became very popular at the World's Fair. There were all kinds of booths that was selling Dr. Pepper, but it was not invented there. It's interesting that it was advertised, as you can see, uh, to give you vim, vigor, and vitality. Again, this was the early 1900s. And believe it or not, there were ads that were much more risque than this. Look at that one. This was uh, around 1900, an ad for, uh, for Dr. Pepper. So uh, uh, this is obviously a different era uh, back then, delightfully refreshing. Uh, not sure whether the delightfully refreshing referred to what is above that line or what is below that line. Right. Uh, AIDS digestion restores vim, vigor, and uh, vitality. Uh, interesting because they also advertise that the beverage contains no stimulants uh, because Coca Cola, of course, did contain some um, uh, caffeine. So they advertise that it had no stimulants. So I don't know where the vim, vigor, and vitality uh, was to come from. All right, let's leave the um, Palace of Agriculture and head over to the Palace of Manufactures, where many different countries had displays, including Germany. And there was an amazing little item that was displayed at the German exhibit. It was labored, labeled as Wuller's Urea. And there was indeed an explanation there, but most people probably didn't bother looking at it, didn't bother to, to read that. But this was really an epic product. Friedrich Wuller was a German chemist, very, very uh, well known uh, already in, in his, his day. And at that time, it was believed that substances that were produced in nature could never be reproduced in the laboratory. So that any chemical that could be extracted from a plant or from human tissues or from blood or from urine, which obviously came from a living source, 
that that could never be reproduced in a laboratory because it had what they referred to as some sort of vital force. Well, then along came Friedrich Wohler in 1828, and he found more or less by accident that when he heated a mineral called ammonium cyanate, which obviously did not come from a living source, it converted into urea. Well, urea was known at that time because it had been isolated from urine. So it was obviously an organic substance, which at that time was thought to have a vital force and therefore could not be reproduced in the lab. But there it was. He excitedly wrote to his mentor, the Swedish professor Berzelius, in a manner of speaking, I can no longer hold my chemical water. I must tell you that I can make urea without the use of kidneys of any animal, be it man or dog. Ammonium cyanate is urea. Well, he wasn't quite right about that. Ammonium cyanate isn't urea, but heating it converts it to urea just by moving the atoms around and joining them in a different way. Urea, as we would now say in, in chemical terms, is an isomer of ammonium cyanate, meaning that it is made up of the same atoms but joined together in a different way. This gave birth to the field of organic chemistry, which today has nothing to do with whether it comes from living things or not, because we know it doesn't matter. What matters is composition, what atoms there are and how they're joined together. Today, the field of organic chemistry is defined as a study of carbon compounds, because most of the compounds that are found in nature are have skeletons in which carbon atoms are joined together. And Wohler realized that this opened up a whole new area of research because these carbon atoms can be put together in many, many different ways. And he said, organic chemistry just now is enough to drive one mad. It gives me the impression of a primeval forest full of the most remarkable things, monstrous and boundless thicket with no way of escape into one they dread to enter. Thus he recognized that if you could make urea in the laboratory, you could make a large variety of compounds synthetically. And this, of course, opened up the field of organic chemistry and Wohler and his uh, conversion of ammonium cyanate to urea was commemorated in this uh, German stamp because it was just a, a pivotal moment in the history of chemistry. So there at the German exhibit in 1904 was a little vial labeled Wohler's urea and most people, of course, just would walk by that without recognizing its importance. But any chemist who walked by that display would probably have a tendency to genuflect and kneel down before it, because this was the birth of modern organic chemistry. Now, interestingly, in conjunction with the St. Louis World's Fair, the 1904 Olympics were held. And an interesting story there as well in the marathon. The uh, marathon was uh, won by uh, Thomas X, who interestingly enough, was boosted by strychnine. In those days, there were absolutely no rules against the use of any drugs in athletics. And strychnine is a stimulant, very much like caffeine. Of course, you have to be very careful with the dose. Uh, you overdose on strychnine and you won't be running any more marathons. But a trace amount can actually give you energy. And Thomas Hicks won the 1904 uh, marathon propelled by uh, strychnine. As I told you at the beginning, unfortunately, there's almost nothing that is left of the uh, World's Fair. There is one ticket booth. This was the ticket booth at the entrance to, to the fair. Everything around it uh, was uh, dismantled by 1905, just a year after. And uh, today, there's only one building that remains, which was built to last permanently. And that was the Palace of Fine Arts. 
And there it is uh, in St. Louis. And in front of it is a statue. And that statue is of King Louis IX, who came to be known as St. Louis. And it is after him that the city of St. Louis is named. Well, he was a very, let us say, interesting French king. He lived in the 13th century and he was fervently Catholic, as of course much of Europe was uh, in those days, and was very dismayed that the Muslims had taken over uh, the holy city. And he led two crusades to the Middle East to try to liberate Jerusalem from the infidels, as they termed it. Well, on one of these crusades, he came back with what he said was the original crown of thorns that Jesus had worn just before his uh, crucifixion. And he built the Saint-Chapelle in Paris, which is a magnificent church. And the Saint-Chapelle was built to house the uh, crown of thorns and also a piece of wood that was said to be from the original cross. Uh, they were eventually moved from uh, the Saint-Chapelle to uh, Notre Dame Cathedral and uh, had to be rescued by firemen when uh, the cathedral uh, almost burned down, right? which was a tragic thing. Now, Louis the the ninth was a huge promoter of Christianity. And when you promote one religion, it automatically means that you degrade other religions. And uh, uh, I'm not sure that one could label him an anti-Semite, uh, but he was just such a huge proponent of Christianity that he fought against all other religions. And he believed that the Talmud, which of course is, is a basic Jewish book that guides Jewish life, uh, that this was, uh, uh, this had anti-Christian beliefs. And he ordered that all the books of the Talmud in France at that time be gathered and burned. And uh, that is a close-up of this, uh, engraving from the from the manuscript so he uh, had a pretty dark side which is the reason that today there's a lot of controversy about that statue that stands in front of the uh, palace of fine arts in st louis and there are demonstrations pro and con ongoing to this day about whether or not that statue should be removed because, of course, the, the Catholics uh, still worship St. Louis. He was canonized by Pope Gregory soon after his death. Uh, but there also are a lot of opponents who say that the statue uh, represents racism and should be removed. So, interesting. There's also another fascinating story about King Louis, and it is about his jawbone. Uh, when King Louis died, he was essentially dismembered and pieces of his body were buried at different places in Europe. And that was something that was not uncommon in those days for revered rulers, so that people could worship their remains in different places. Anyway, his jawbone uh, was in, in Paris, and recently it was allowed to be examined to see whether or not it's authentic because stories had been handed down through the ages together with the jawbone uh, and it seemed that that there was a, a proper thread of evidence so that it could be his his jawbone and now it was investigated and indeed through radiocarbon dating they did find that it dates to the 13th uh, uh, century so it probably was uh, uh, his. And uh, what they also discovered that there were some lesions, characteristic lesions in that jawbone, uh, which uh, 
uh, were a sign of scurvy. And in those days, scurvy was a pretty common disease. Uh, they didn't know, of course, what it was. Today, we know that scurvy is vitamin C deficiency. And uh, uh, Louis did not have a, a widespread diet. He had a very austere diet. Uh, he very often fasted uh, for penance. Uh, he was, as I said, a strict Catholic. He constantly wore what was called a hair shirt uh, to make him uncomfortable as continuous penance, crazy ideas like that. Uh, and he very often fasted and he ate almost nothing but fish. So it's very possible that he really did suffer from scurvy. So anyway, the uh, jawbone of Louis the Ninth uh, gives us a nice entry point to modern times and chewing. So what about chewing on the impossible burger? This has become very popular in recent years and uh, it is called impossible burger because the allegation is that, that uh, it's impossible to make a plant burger taste like a real burger. So they have achieved the impossible. That's the, uh, that's the message here. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, there are opponents of the impossible burger. Uh, today, there's no matter what, there's opposition to it. And any issue you bring up, so there will be someone who opposes it. They say, well, you know, it's a processed food and we shouldn't be eating processed foods. Well, yeah, of course it is, it is a processed food. Uh, it is processed from vegetable products. And you can see it's basically soy protein. That's the first ingredient. And indeed, there are a number of other in in ingredients. There's some yeast extract in there. There's methyl cellulose that kind of uh, binds it uh, together. Uh, but the fact is that, nutritionally speaking, uh, this plant burger is very similar to, uh, to a regular meat burger. It has roughly the same protein content, same fat content. When you look on the label, uh, it has more salt uh, than raw hamburger meat. However, when you make a hamburger, you don't just take the burger and, and cook it, right? You normally add spices and certainly salt to it. So once you've, already, once you've added some salt to a regular meat burger, uh, in terms of nutrition, it's the same as the Impossible Burger. However, the Impossible Burger is not sold as some sort of, you know, health alternative to the regular meat burger. That's not the point. The Impossible Burger is sold as an alternative because of its environmental benefits. And those actually are, are quite significant. If you take a look uh, at the footprint, which means what materials do we consume when we make it, transportation costs, etc., compared to a beef burger. So, Look at the, here, the footprint relative to a beef burger. So you can see that in terms of greenhouse gases, producing the Impossible Burger produces only about 10% of the greenhouse gases that are produced when, with a regular hamburger. Well, ha regular hamburger, of course, the animals are transported, their food is transported, the food has to be grown, etc. So obviously, in terms of the environment, there's no question that these plant-based burgers are to be preferred. Here's another interesting comparison in terms of carbon dioxide emissions. If you compare uh, a conventional burger, much, much more CO2 emissions than with the Impossible Burger. Amount of water that is used in production is much less and the land that is needed to grow it, much less than for animals. So in terms of, of uh, benefits to the environment, it is true that these vegetable-based burgers are, are better for the uh, environment. Now, let's face it, uh, animal agriculture is not an environmentally friendly business. The only trouble is those animals taste good, but, but uh, you, you cannot make a scientific argument 
for uh, eating animals, because it certainly is possible to have a perfectly adequate uh, diet based on, on plant products. Now, the other objection that some people have against this impossible uh, burger is that the flavor, which is really a meat-like flavor, comes from a compound uh, that is known as leg hemoglobin. Leg is short for legume. Uh, pro, uh, soybeans are a legume, and the roots of the soybean plant produce a compound which is leg hemoglobin, which is similar to the hemoglobin that is found in meat. And it gives very similar flavor to meat. Now, why do people object to this? Because of the way that it is produced. What researchers have done is to take the gene from the soybean that codes for the production of that leg hemoglobin and through genetic engineering techniques, they implant it into a bacterium or into a yeast, which then produces the leg hemoglobin. But the product that is produced is exactly the same product that is found naturally in the soybean. There are people who object to any genetic modification usually because they don't have an understanding of what it really is all about. Now, of course, uh, soy, being a plant, is composed of many, many, many different substances naturally occurring, organic substances. Uh, for example, some of them are what we call isoflavones. These are carbon compounds. And this also, for some people, raises a controversy. And if you followed any of the TikTok nonsense, for example, with suggestions that if you eat these soy burgers, if men eat it, they're going to turn into women. Where does this come from? It comes from the fact that those isoflavones actually have a chemical similarity to estrogen, which is the female sex hormone. And indeed, uh, when you take a look at estradiol, which is the main female sex hormone, it does have a chemical similarity to genistein, which is found in, in soybeans. Estrogen, of course, is extremely important for many physiological functions, and it works by fitting into receptors on cells, very much like a key fits into a lock. Well, these isoflavones also fit into there. So what's the controversy? because excessive amounts of estrogen have been linked to breast cancer. Okay, that is true. There are breast cancers which are said to be estrogen sensitive. Well, what uh, the critics of isoflavones don't understand is that while it is true that these isoflavones or so-called phytoestrogens because they come from a plant source, are very, very weak estrogens. Yes, they do bind into the same receptors, but very weakly. It's insignificant. But of course, one can make it sound very significant. If we look at the epidemiological evidence, what we see is that in Asia, the risk of breast cancer, the rate of breast cancer, is one third of that in Western countries. Now, it's hard to say you know, exactly why, because there's so many differences, uh, but they eat a great deal of soy products, far, far more than we consume here in North America. So there is no uh, link to breast cancer when you take a look at the massive amounts that they consume, uh, consume there. Now, that does not mean that there are not some concerns about people who are taking supplements of these isoflavones that you can buy in health food stores. They're taking these instead of prescribed estrogen, which sometimes is prescribed for women who are struggling with menopause. This is a different story because here, the concentration of these isoflavones is way, way higher than you would naturally find in soybeans. 
So here, it is possible that there could be some, some issues. So while I think that there is no concern whatsoever about eating soy, I think that we do not have any evidence to suggest taking any kind of soy supplement. Now, when you go into a health food store, of course, you find all kinds of supplements, including cinnamon. Yeah, cinnamon as a health supplement. I mean, we're familiar with cinnamon, of course. Cinnamon is a spice. Uh, it's a very interesting spice because of uh, the origin. Uh, it comes from the bark of a tree. You have to strip the, uh, the bark and you grind it up and that's how you get cinnamon. And of course, we're familiar with the flavor of, of cinnamon. At one time, believe it or not, cinnamon was more valuable than gold. It was used by the Egyptians in their embalming process. We don't know exactly why, uh, probably to reduce the smell of the decaying uh, corpse. Uh, the Romans were very fond of cinnamon. Nero uh, apparently sprinkled cinnamon on his wife's funeral pyre. So when she burned, it would give off a nice pleasant uh, smell, intriguing. In the Middle Ages, cinnamon was uh, uh, suggested as uh, a remedy for coughs, colds, etc. And today, uh, cinnamon is said to be beneficial for various kinds of, of uh, health issues, as you can see, may help treat type 2 diabetes. Now, what you will notice in all of these ads that you see these days on the internet, is this weasel word, may. Because as soon as you say that, they are legally off the hook. If they would say it treats type 2 diabetes, there would be a problem for them because then they would have to come up with evidence that it does. But if you use the word may, you can sell anything. And you know, I say that's a weasel word because may happen. What does that mean? Yes, there, a flying saucer may land tomorrow in front of the White House, right? Not likely to happen, but it may. So those are the kind of uh, weasel words. And they make all kinds of claims about the benefits of cinnamon, as you can see here. Lowers cholesterol, good for diabetes, uh, etc. Well, of course, today, there's a great deal of interest in exploring plant products as a source of medications, because there are various medicines that come from plants. I mean, obviously, morphine, right, comes from the poppy. Uh, digoxin was first discovered in the foxglove plant. There are many, many remedies that we use today that originate in, in plants. So basically, every pharmaceutical company has a division where they are looking, you know, to extract compounds from plants that may have some benefit. Well, cinnamon is very complex. I mean, there are hundreds of different compounds in there of, of many different molecular structures, large array of so-called polyphenols, which you know, have a sort of a legendary beneficial effect. But virtually all plants contain these. There's nothing special about cinnamon. So what we need to do is look to see published literature. Is there anything that backs up the claims? Well, unfortunately, these days, there's so much scientific literature being published of all kinds, some good, some bad, mostly mediocre, that you can find a study to back up almost any view. This study, for example, shows that you can get a little bit of benefit in your blood glucose control from cinnamon. But you can also find studies that show exactly the opposite. And in fact, the American Diabetes Association says, no, there, there's no point in taking any cinnamon to try to control your diabetes. But today there's another area that they're looking at, and that's the brain. Uh, because there have been a number of papers published on whether or not eating cinnamon can benefit cognitive function. 
Again, you can find some studies where people eat a spoonful of cinnamon every day and they do questionnaires which seem to show that they can remember certain words better, but you find studies that don't show any benefit at all. And then uh, here, for example, they talk about uh, a study in, in a Petri dish which showed that when you take cells and you expose them to cinnamon, you get less of an aggregation of a protein called beta amyloid, which is a hallmark of, of Alzheimer's disease. But this in no way means that taking cinnamon is going to prevent Alzheimer's uh, disease. There's just a lack of evidence. So if you like cinnamon, by all means, sprinkle it on your apples, have your cinnamon toast, uh, if you like to stir your tea with some, uh, with a cinnamon stick, go ahead. Uh, but I would say that uh, a cinnamon roll is not the way to go about increasing your uh, cinnamon intake because, of course, it is loaded with fat and is loaded with sugar. But, you know, the health food people will cherry pick the data and sell cinnamon as a health food product. Although interestingly enough, you know, healthy glucose metabolism, they don't say anything about it, right? Other than that it is okay if it's already within the normal range. So then what on earth is the benefit, right? But people don't read uh, this thing, uh, they see this, healthy glucose metabolism, it means absolutely nothing, it's just a string of words, right? Uh, so this is pure puffery. But let me just uh, go to a much more serious uh, business, because there's a new devil these days that's out on the streets. And uh, it is in the form of um, drugs known as the nidazines. Nidazines uh, basically were developed when researchers were looking for an alternative to fentanyl. Fentanyl is an amazing painkiller, but as you know, there are problems with it. It has an addictive potential. Uh, fentanyl itself was developed as an alternative to the opiates like, like morphine and heroin. And uh, the idea is to find a molecule that fits into receptors and mimics the action of uh, opium without the side effects. Fentanyl and its close derivatives falls into that category. Their molecular structure is such that will, it will activate the same receptors as the opioids, but it is still addictive. Well, it turns out that these nidazines are very effective opiate analogs, and they are now flooding the streets. The problem is that they're easy to synthesize. Anyone with a basic knowledge of organic chemistry in a basement lab can make these. Now, originally, they were researched as proper pharmaceutical drugs, in Switzerland, and the hope was that they would be alternatives to uh, fentanyl and to other opiates. It turned out that that wasn't the case. They actually were more addictive and they depressed respiration even more. But they are now appearing on the streets, being synthesized in underground labs and being sold on the street. Now, these underground ground labs these days are not exactly like the one that I just showed you with someone here working at home. These are coming from China and they have a totally unregulated drug industry there. And they are cranking out these nitrazines, flooding them on US streets. And already there are something like 250 people who have died uh, overdosing on this because even the, the ones who are addicted to fentanyl, who are now buying this on the street because they can't get the fentanyl, because that is, is, is being controlled, are overdosing because the same amount of nitazines as fentanyl kills you. Uh, there are, if you find someone, there are uh, ways to 
uh, try to revive them with the use of naloxone, which displaces the nitazine from those uh, receptors. But nevertheless, this is a new devil that we're uh, fighting uh, on the streets. And these underground chemists, unfortunately, are always a step ahead. You know, and, and if you make one drug illegal, they just do a little chemical modification and they come out with a, a, a new version. Okay, I don't want to leave you on such a sad note though. So let's uh, go to a happier story. We're going to go to South Africa and uh, a winery there. And uh, it's a very special winery. It's a very good uh, wine estate. And as you can see the symbol here, those are ducks, and they are a very special kind of duck. They are called runner ducks. They don't waddle, they run very, very quickly. Well, there are about 2,000 of these runner ducks that are housed in that winery. And every morning, they are released from their paddock and they march out en masse into the fields. Why? Because they are essentially pesticides. They will eat the bugs on the grapevines, especially the snails, which are a problem there. These ducks just love the snails. So whereas other wineries have to use chemicals like metaldehyde to kill the snails, here, the ducks do that. And it has even become a tourist attraction. Tourists come to watch the march of the ducks as they come out every morning. Now, these ducks are actually very peaceful. They have no mechanism, no way to protect themselves. And there are owls and mongoose in the area that feast on ducks. So there are special guards that go with the ducks. Geese. Geese are very combative. And as soon as they see a predator like an owl or a mongoose, they start screaming and flapping their wings and scare the predators away. So they shepherd the ducks around. And then at four o'clock in the afternoon, the ducks march back into their paddock to come out again the next day. There's a restaurant at the winery where you can enjoy the runner duck wine. What else would they call it? And they make different versions of the runner duck uh, wine. Unfortunately, it's not available here at the liquor store, uh, but you can uh, get it online. Also at that restaurant, you can taste duck eggs but you cannot taste duck because the owner of the winery says that the ducks are colleagues and you do not eat your colleagues. Well, these runner ducks have all kinds of fans. There's actually an Indian runner duck club. <laughs> and believe it or not, you, they write articles about breeding the little creatures, crossbreeding them, etc., because you can get some really neat colors. And you can even have Indian runner ducks as pets. And if you're interested in that, there is the owner's uh, manual. I think it's pretty challenging to have an Indian rubber duck as a pet. So I just stick to my uh, uh, plastic and uh, rubber uh, duckies. Uh, but uh, I would like to taste the Indian rubber or the Indian runner duck uh, wine. And uh, I, I think that you can actually buy it online and they will, they will send it. So I might uh, go for that. All right, well, that's it. And remember that we do have a website where you can always check out uh, interesting stories and um, you can sign up for our weekly newsletter and you can also get information on happenings. And there is something that is happening on May 11th. Uh, we're going to sponsor a movie it's called Virulent the Vaccine War, and it's the story of how the COVID vaccines were developed, all of the controversies, 
but of course it's going to be done in a very scientific way and we will have the producers of this movie with us from California and after the film we're going to uh, have a discussion uh, about the movie and about uh, vaccines and uh, you can get uh, more information of course by just clicking on the link there and it is free but we do ask you to to register so that we have an idea of how many people are, are coming. So that is it for today. Uh, happy Passover for those of you who are going to be uh, observing that. And uh, we'll see you again next month, unless there's any question. Yeah. You were surprised about the fear in St. Louis that it was all taken down? Yeah. That's the terms of reference of World Exhibition. You think about Expo 67, all of those wonderful structures. That's true. Buildings, yeah. All had to be dismantled yeah. within a year. Yeah. And well, it took here special dispensation to get whatever is left still yeah. to stay. But the only major thing we have left is the biosphere, right? Yeah. Or there is the, the casino. The casino, yeah. And the the a couple of the metal statues are still still there. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah, talk about the COVID uh, vaccine, how it was developed. Aren't they talk now about how um, our um, our medicines, our um, antibiotics, are not going to work anymore because it's super bugs. Is that, is that part of this? this, is, this is, you're hearing this. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, scientists have to stay one step ahead of nature, you know. And yes, uh, you develop an antibiotic that works for a while, but then the bugs develop resistance, so you have to develop another one. Same thing goes for viruses and vaccines. It's going to be a constant battle. Yeah, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a war that we can win but we can win the battles. Okay.